But there is still, of course, the possibility that, well, as much as 100 yards from our goal, we fall through the ice. What did we decide? Would we freeze to death or drown first? I think we will freeze to death in the act of drowning. This date probably doesn't mean much to you, and I mean, why would it? It was a long time ago. George Bush was president, Umbrella was number one in the UK, and Harry Potter 5 was the movie of the month. But this innocuous date, 16 years ago, also saw the release of what I consider to be one of the greatest hours of television in history because that was the day the Top Gear Polar Special was released. An epic 400 mile race between a pickup truck and a dog sled team to the North Pole. A race that marked the first time a car had ever been driven there and when they set out, there was no knowing whether or not it was even possible. And this perilous race through all the dangers of the Arctic was not being done by elite athletes or seasoned polar explorers, but three of the most uncoordinated and unfit men on the planet. Okay. Whoa! <laughs> This vault stuck to my lips. Oh, Christ. Oh, thanks a bunch! It's taken me 20 minutes, minutes to get there! In the published production notes for the show, the Top Gear producers noted that we felt it might be considered irresponsible to send our three pampered presenters into the most inhospitable environment on Earth completely unaided. After all, their combined pre-Top Gear extreme cold weather experience consisted solely of Jeremy's biannual skiing holiday and James once building a really big snowman. And they weren't lying. May and Hammond had never even skied before, as their training shows. Oh god, sorry, 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 sorry! Oh, sorry! <laughs> sorry! Sorry! And as you watch that, remember that Hammond was supposed to be racing the car by dog sled and skis, which went well. <laughs> and on top of all of that, May didn't even want to do this at all. Can I just make it absolutely clear now that I'm only here because the producer said I had to be? So I hate the idea that I've got to push my body to find the limit. And I hate the zips and the toggles and all the pockets and that. If we make it, you will be the first person ever to go to the North Pole who didn't want to be there. But the Polar Special is historic not just because of the achievement of driving a car to the North Pole for the first time, but because it marked a turning point in the history of Top Gear. The Polar Special is what firmly catapulted it from just a pokey motoring show on BBC Two into a global TV juggernaut. A juggernaut that at its peak drew up to 350 million viewers across almost every single territory and country in the world. Sorry. In the world. So before we look at what makes the Polar Special such an outstanding episode of TV, let's go into reverse gear for a bit and put it in context. Oh, and before we go any further, I should acknowledge that Jeremy Clarkson is not exactly a universally loved figure. But I'm not going to get into all of this in this video because it's not the point, but I will say that even if you are appalled by the things he has said, you should still watch this video because the Polar Special sees Clarkson getting pushed into a frozen lake by a Special Forces instructor who got sick of his attitude. I'm in chest, mate. Pull yourself out, pull yourself out! Come on, push him out, mate! Oh, how dare you! Hands above your head, hands above your head! Hands above your head! That looked awful. Oh, I'm staggered. Anyway, Top Gear was a small, relatively factual car show that had been on the air since the late 1970s, before being modernised and relaunched in 2002 with its hosts Jeremy Clarkson, Richard Hammond and Jason Dore. That's right, Captain Slow didn't even make it to hosting Top Gear in time. He would come on board in Season 2, replacing Dore. From here, the show steadily gained in popularity, as the focus moved on from being a relatively factual car show to one that approached its subject matter more from an entertainment perspective. These early seasons saw the development of what would go on to become a Top Gear staple, the epic race. Starting in Season 4, which saw Clarkson and Aston Martin racing May and Hammond on the Eurostar to Monte Carlo, each subsequent season saw at least one epic, usually international race between a car and some other mode of transport. By the time Season 9 aired at the start of 2007, Top Gear's new format had launched the show into prime time territory. And 2007 was a year that saw not one, but two seasons of Top Gear air in the UK. Season 9 aired in January through March, then at the end of the year the BBC released Season 10 for a total of 16 episodes. It was a massive show and it dominated every water cooler chat in Britain that year. And in July, right between those two seasons, came the Polar Special. See, as Top Gear grew in popularity and therefore got a budget increase to match, they began to produce special episodes one-off adventures separate from the studio and the usual formula that instead focused on a single epic adventure. 
These specials went on to become some of the more memorable episodes of the entire show. Like the Vietnam special where Clarkson can't ride a motorbike, the Middle East special where they get dropped into a military airbase in Iraq, the Botswana special with the lovable Oliver, or the Patagonia special that saw an angry mob chase the crew out of Argentina. The specials were what came to define Top Gear and set it apart from any other show. It became a series that was constantly surprising us by going off the beaten track and placing the most unlikely hosts in the most unlikely of circumstances, giving them challenges and seeing what happened. How hot can it be? Don't say that! But that all started with the Polar Special. At the time this aired, the only other specials had been the Winter Olympics one that saw May falling down a ski ramp, and the US road trip special that saw an angry mob chase the crew out of Alabama. Hmm, the Americas are not kind to Top Gear. But the Polar Special was something entirely different. Nothing like this had ever really been seen before, and to be honest, hasn't really been seen since. In 2007, if TV audiences had seen much of the Arctic, it was probably either in a nature documentary or on the news. See, this was released only a year or so after An Inconvenient Truth brought climate change and the melting of the polar ice caps into the mainstream conversation, but we'll come back to that. So when the Polar Special aired, it took us to one of the most desolate and hostile places on Earth and told us that we were about to watch these three jokers make history or die trying. And for once, that's not a metaphor. The episode features an extended segment of them joking about in their typical fashion while actual polar explorers are trying to tell them just how dangerous their endeavor is and how likely they are to die. There's all kinds of dangers waiting for you and you don't see that the ice is just a few centimeters thick. If, if your whole body fell in and the car had gone in and your tent had gone in because you presumably stow that in the back mm. of the car, you could probably survive for, if there was no wind, hours. Why is that it is called Polar Bear Pass? In my mind, it's a pass full of polar bears. It, that's exactly what it is. All the bears love to creep up on you when you're taking a crap and you've got your trousers down. That's not exactly sporting of them, is it, really? This is when Clarkson gets pushed into the ice. I'm in chest, bag. Right? By the way, if you like the video and subscribe, I promise to play that clip one more time in the video. Anyway, preparation for the Polar Special began in December 2006, almost six months out from the expedition itself. Icelandic company Arctic Trucks began modifying a Toyota Hilux pickup truck to survive the Arctic conditions. The Hilux was of course well known to Top Gear audiences. One of the most famous segments from the early seasons was the team attempting to destroy one and consistently failing, even after it got demolished along with a block of flats. This was always going to be the car Top Gear chose to take to the North Pole. But the presenters of course were not going alone. Clarkson and May in their car were accompanied by two other cars, a second modified Hilux towing the custom built equipment trailer as well as a modified land cruiser. Between the mechanics, film crew, a doctor and security officer, team car consisted of nine people in total. Over on Team Dog, it was a much leaner operation, with Hammond teamed up with Sled Dog legend Matty McNair and her team of ten huskies. But this I've just been weed on. Did they have to weigh on me? They were accompanied by a small film crew that travelled with the dogs on a skidoo, which also served to evacuate them if something went wrong. While the vehicles were being prepped, the presenters were given a crash course in Arctic travel and survival, including by the legendary Sir Ranulph Fiennes. And before you ask, yes he is related to Ralph Fiennes. Oh, and because this is a Pentex video and I can't resist some Bond trivia, Ranulph Fiennes was even shortlisted to replace Sean Connery as James Bond back in the 1970s, but lost out to Roger Moore. It was a big surprise out of 200 when I got in the last six. And uh, then you get in there, there was broccoli, small bloke with a cigar. He took one look at Guy and he said, this bloke looks like a farmer. And look at his hands. He didn't even talk to me. And that was it. Anyway, back to Top Gear. After enduring the trio joking about and admitting they aren't really taking this seriously, there's an astonishing moment where Fines calmly but firmly calls them out on this in his typically understated fashion. The problem we have is that we can't really get into our heads that this is a particularly dangerous place to go. But you think it is? No, I don't think it is. I, I know that it can be um, because of what's happened to me in that area over the last 36 years. And moments later, the laughter completely vanishes from the faces of our hosts when he shows them his amputated fingers, the result of a three-minute mistake during one of his visits to the Arctic. Three minutes of inattention in this environment saw him lose the fingers of his left hand to frostbite. And he also warns them about this. The fact that you will all start hating each other um, because of the extreme cold having an effect. The hatred is very real, and you don't want to laugh about it, which I think you lot seem to be doing. We see this warning become very real later in the episode, 
with May and Clarkson becoming increasingly and genuinely angry at each other as the incredibly harsh conditions and exhausting effort of their mission begin to take a physical and mental toll on the hosts. Come on, can, can you just put it in? Just please, James. But I'm so unspeakably Be quick outraged for with you. See, one of the keys to Top Gear's success is the dynamic between these three hosts. The trio of Clarkson, Hammond and May is absolutely perfectly balanced and no matter what shenanigans they're up to, it is always entertaining. But why have you got an automatic? I bust my arm. That's why it took a long time to get out. Have you really broken your arm? Which arm have you broken? <laughs> Sometimes their banter is played up for the cameras for a laugh. Clarkson! I know it's you, you insufferable oaf. I'm on the bloody throne! But what makes the poll special different is that it totally breaks the hosts. Look at May and Clarkson when they set off versus when they arrive at the poll just a week later. The short tempers and arguments that we see in this episode are genuine, but at the same time so is their elation when they succeed. The emotions and exhaustion we see them go through are some of the most real things we have seen in Top Gear. Like, take this scene when they're driving over thin ice that's threatening to crack beneath them. This is genuine fear. Look at how May is clutching the axe in case they need to smash their way out. For all of the support crew and the safety nets, in this moment, it is just these two TV presenters sitting in a car, with nothing but a thin sheet of ice separating them from certain death. Just a few weeks earlier before the expedition, they'd be making jokes like this. But he's been practicing his face he's going to pull when he dies. That's one of them. Try another. <laughs> the thing about death out here is that once you're dead, you freeze. I want my body to be found wearing the appropriate expression. The brilliance of Top Gear is that it sets that sort of joking banter against the reality that they still have to actually do the thing. In these moments, May and Clarkson had to confront the reality that they might actually fall through the ice and die. This is scary. If we go in here, we're dead, aren't we? I mean, dead. And that's the sort of tension you simply cannot script. Of course, Clarkson did fall through the ice earlier in the episode. I'm in chest, Pug. But if you thought this journey took a toll on Clarkson and May, then spare a thought for the hamster. He arrived in the Arctic a week earlier than the other two to have a crash course on dog sledding. But despite being the youngest and the fittest of the bunch and having the whitest teeth, Hammond began to break down from exhaustion even faster than May and Clarkson. Several times throughout the episode, he filmed small little personal vlogs, showing us the ice on his sleeping bag or around his face. In these moments, he's not a TV presenter with a film crew looking at him, but a broken, exhausted man alone in his tent with a camera. I had a little weep. I haven't done that for years. And out here, the tears cause moisture in your ski goals and it froze on the inside so I couldn't see. Top Gear doesn't normally do this style of self-filming presentation. It's a bit more polished than that, but the complexities of filming in the polar environment with the small crew accompanying Hammond meant it was the only way for him to share his thoughts with the audience. And whether because of the privacy or the exhaustion or both, he shares his thoughts far more candidly than I think he would if the crew were shooting this. It's genuine and sincere, and it sets the polar special apart from every other Top Gear episode. But it wasn't all doom and gloom, and that's not just because the sun doesn't ever set during the polar summer. See, besides the chemistry between the three hosts, the other thing that Top Gear specials excel at is pacing and narrative flow. Now that might sound strange for a factual show, factual, but it really is important. See, while fictionalised TV can control the flow of a story how it wants, the art of a good factual show or documentary is taking the real-life events as they happened and crafting them into a compelling narrative. The Polar Special, like all of the great Top Gear episodes, follows a classic three-act structure. There is the first act that establishes the status quo, the dangers our heroes will face, and an inciting incident, in this case, the start of the race. Then there is the ascending action where everything seems to be going great. It lulls us into the fun and joy of the adventure. The beautiful scenery and the larking about between May and Clarkson as they bust out some wine in the tent, or when May prepares gin and tonics in the car. Got the ice? That's a stupid question, isn't it? By the way, this segment famously drew complaints to the BBC because it was seen to be glamorising drink driving, despite Clarkson saying this. And please do not write to us about drinking and driving because I'm not driving, I'm saving. But just as the fun reaches the point where they break out a snowboard, we get to the midpoint when it all comes crashing down. The crew gets stuck, 
The presenters get stuck and progress is blisteringly slow as our heroes become more and more exhausted. In the boulder field, they cover less than one mile an hour as all three cars are constantly getting stuck in the near impassable labyrinth of solid polar ice. It gets so bad that Clarkson loses his patience and drives characteristically recklessly, resulting in massive damage to the vehicle and another bollocking from May. Sometimes, James, you have to move fast, and that was an Sometimes, occasion. Jeremy, you have to move slowly. For example, going over the soft snow, where we've been told time and again there are huge lumps of immobile ice, which is exactly what's caused that. And running parallel to this, of course, is the drama of the race. This gives a level of personal competition between the hosts as an additional layer over the tension of the adventure itself. In the other specials, the trio tend to work together as a team to complete challenges laid down by the producers. In the Polar Special, it's just a race. And the race, like a great action scene, employs the concept of reversals to maintain the tension throughout the episode. A reversal is when a character gains some sort of advantage only for it to be immediately taken away again, i.e. reversing the fortunes of the protagonist. It's a way to keep action scenes balanced. There's no tension if one character is winning all the time. There has to be the possibility of defeat. The Polar Special is edited to deliver tension in exactly this way. At the start, the car is steaming ahead of the dogs and it seems hopeless for Hammond. But then they reach the boulder ice field and the cars get bogged down, allowing Hammond to power through and close the lead. Then Hammond starts to feel the toll of the race, while Clarkson and May enjoyed bars of chocolate in the comfort of the car. But then they almost plunge through the ice, while Team Dog deploys a kite to gain ground. While in reality the sled was never really close enough to the car for it to be a real competition, the show is still presented in a way that creates dramatic tension between the two teams. That makes for good TV and this is the sort of storytelling liberty that a show like Top Gear can take. Because it is entertainment first and foremost, they can use the magic of editing to build a compelling narrative, even if there is a slightly different reality. But the reality, or you might say the inconvenient truth of the Top Gear Polar Special is that they did not go to the true North Pole. They went to the magnetic North Pole. If you don't know the difference, watch this CGP Grey video, but basically when someone says the North Pole, you probably think of either this, or more seriously, this. The magnetic North Pole is where your compass needle points and it's not aligned with the so-called true North Pole. The Top Gear crew were aiming for and made it to the position of the magnetic North Pole, as recorded in 1996, not the true North Pole at the very top of the Earth. But you know what? It doesn't matter. While the episode itself never makes it explicit which pole they are aiming for, the BBC has never attempted to hide the fact that they went to the magnetic, not true North Pole. They even show the coordinates in the episode. Some people might feel let down by this revelation, but I for one am not. The difficulty of this journey across the Arctic to the magnetic North Pole is clearly shown in the Polar Special, and distinguishing between the two versions of the North Pole feels a bit academic for those of us sitting at our computers having never come close to either. Anyway, once they arrived at the Pole and May enjoyed his celebratory turn of spam, the presenters were airlifted to safety, leaving the remaining crew to make the same perilous 400 mile journey home with the vehicles and equipment. Hammond sadly never reached the North Pole. It's a crushing moment actually when the gleeful May and Clarkson call him to confirm their victory. See for them it's just like any other epic race where the winners get gloating rights over the others who sportingly congratulate them. But here Hammond is too exhausted to react. You can just see in his eyes the realisation that all of that effort and exhaustion had been for nothing. It's devastating. I don't know if he ever wanted to reach the North Pole or not, but I wish he had continued and made it there. But then again, seeing how completely destroyed he was from the journey, perhaps all he wanted to do was head home to a warm bed and a couple of pints. Hi! We would like two pints of bitter, one rosé wine, large, a bag of salt and vinegar crisps, and built on! The Polar Special firmly established the popularity of the special adventure episode format for Top Gear. From then on, almost every season began or ended with such an episode, starting later that very same year with the Botswana special, a personal favourite of mine. Float! 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 Oliver! But the magic and adventure of the Polar Special was never to be repeated, and sadly it may never be again. Since satellite records began, Arctic sea ice has declined by more than 50%, and in the latest assessment report, the IPCC expect it will drop below 1 million square kilometres before 2050. If this continues, there might not be much of an Arctic left to drive on. But at least there won't be any polar bears left alive to eat you either, so perhaps that makes it marginally safer. 
The closest the polar special comes to addressing the impact of climate change on polar ice is a quip about an inconvenient truth and this brief exchange about polar bears. The polar bear issue is, I can't get whipped up about that because every single night on the, even George Bush is now saying there are no polar bears left. But let me be clear that I do not expect or even want Top Gear to talk about the melting polar ice caps and I'm not criticising them for omitting any discussion of climate change from the episode, especially considering the time it was made. It's not the point of the show, just like it's not the point of this video, and other BBC productions like the Frozen Planet series have done remarkable jobs at showcasing the impact of climate change on these environments in a far more effective way than Top Gear could or should. But I think that shows how far the conversation has come in the last 16 years. I don't think you can make a show or a video about the Arctic today and not at least acknowledge the sad reality of its decline. It'd be like making a video essay about Kevin Spacey and not addressing any of this. It doesn't need to be the main focus, but you can't just totally ignore it either. But all that aside, I still give credit to the Polar Special, because what it does do exceptionally well is document the astonishing, unique beauty of this epic, deserted landscape and the ecosystem it supports. Watching it should be enough to convince anyone that the Arctic is worth protecting. It certainly did that for me. And much like the Arctic sea ice itself, Top Gear is, sadly, past its prime. Since the main trio left, the show was just never able to recapture the chemistry of those original three hosts. Meanwhile, the Grand Tour was an acceptable but underwhelming follow-up that was only saved by our pre-existing affinity for the hosts. Even they seem to realise this, and now the Grand Tour is exclusively doing one-off, feature-length epic adventures, the best of which managed to recapture some of that classic Top Gear spirit. But although at times they came close, no other episode of Top Gear or of the Grand Tour ever quite rose to the heights of ambition, entertainment, danger and sheer adventure of the Polar Special. It was a journey like no other before or since, and we got to go along for the ride. I mean look at that, it's not bad is it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely astonishing. <laughs> 